Chris. Hey, Attorney General. How are you? Very good. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel really short in this thing. Should I adjust it? You should buckle up. It's the law. I, should, I was going to tell you that. Okay, here we go. Buckle up. Got it. Okay. All right, so uh, first things first, I, I think this is a real hot button uh, issue. Uh, not in the primary, but uh, definitely in the general. The, the issue of uh, medicinal marijuana use. Oh, yes. yes. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if you've talked to the media about this, but just uh, as the attorney general, do you have a stance? Yeah. I, yes or no? Well, you know what I did is um, an actual uh, stance on it. I What I have done in the past was uh, submit uh, my an AG position, opinion regarding um, it as it as it as it affects law enforcement, and that's basically what um, uh, I've, I've done. I'm, I'm just concerned there there's some issues that have have uh, started to show itself in Colorado and Washington and all the other states uh, that have medicinal, but you know of course Colorado and uh, and uh, Washington are all they prove recreational. Yeah. Um, but even those that uh, that are purely medicinal at this point. The concerns that I've always had and, and uh, I've shared with the other attorneys general there in those states is that uh, as much as and as hard as they try to keep it out of the uh, kids' hands, it makes, it makes its way into the kids' hands. You have uh, kids coming into school, you know, unfortunately stoned. You have kids uh, consuming consumables. You know, they, they try to make it um, as palatable as possible which unfortunately also makes it easy for kids to to get at. Um, and you're, you're of course talking about the consumables in terms of the chocolates, the marijuana candies, the brownies, and, yeah. and uh, well, we've had brownies for many years. Yeah. Already, so, but, but you know the, the candies, and uh, they I think there's they have lollipops and things like that. Do, so, you, do you think though that that's an issue uh, along the same lines as prescription medicine, where let's say uh, grandma hurts her back, she gets prescribed Percocet, and then. Uh, the grandchild or the child uh, goes in the medicine cabinet and, and gets the Percocet and is popping pills. Do you, do you think that medicinal marijuana it can would need to be regulated in the same ways as prescription drugs? But even with that regulation, they're still going to have cases where it falls through the cracks and you have kids, like you said, getting high off uh, mom or dad's stash. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's a concern that uh, as attorneys general we do have, and, and I have it's a concern I've had. I have, and it's, it's the abuse of any legal substance, any legal, you know, alcohol is legal. You know, you have to be a certain age to, to get it and uh, so forth. But there's always going to be that abuse. But then with the addition of marijuana, medical marijuana coming in, there's that additional substance that, that needs to be abused. And, and, um, and I'm listening to what uh, public health is saying, that they're not necessarily ready, ready to, to take this on. They'll try. And if it becomes law, obviously, as the attorney general, I'll try to um, uphold the laws as as well as I could. But with the abuse, um, those are things that I'm going to be looking at and making sure that I report that to the legislature. Should that uh, should it come down to it? But if it becomes law, it's something that I'll uh, obviously try to follow as the attorney general. Do you think it's a case of uh, putting the cart before the horse in terms of? Uh, medicinal marijuana vote yes or no and then after we figure out if it's yes or no then we're gonna go and we're gonna form a commission we're gonna you know uh, pass laws for dispensaries because it kind of seems like we're being posed the question of do you support it but uh, a lot of the secondary groundwork in terms of like instituting medicinal marijuana they haven't even looked at that yet. well there there are a lot it, that's that's one way to put it because there's so many things that need to be set up before you even start thinking about this and an issue that I think might slowly be taken care of by the federal government is that that uh, under FDIC rules and under banking laws you can't deposit um, proceeds from yeah. illegal yeah. and that that's causing problems in uh, a lot of the states that have uh, medicinal and recreational uses because now you have these large amounts of money that they can't put in the bank and right I mean, right. they're basically, I think, kind of uh, silently endorsing money laundering because we have all this money you can't put in the bank, so what do you do with it? Right, and these are these are things that, that I don't think uh, people think about. Uh, and there are, for every one thing you actually think about, there may be 10 things that, uh, that still need to be uh, 
discussed. Uh, what is it that uh, Donald Rumsfeld said years ago? You know, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. You know, and, and until you know, uh, you can't address the problem. And so, I mean, I'm hoping that if there is if there is legislation that it uh, deals with strictly the medical portion of it, because there are uh, the substances, the actual. Um, uh, substances that they can take out of the smoking uh, smoking version because even the medical doctors are concerned that uh, everybody's smoked concerned. marijuana yeah smoke marijuana is really not the best avenue I mean, if you take a syringe that has great medicine but if if you, if you uh, have a, uh, a needle that is dirty or blocked uh, holes in the side and you're not going to get the, the the full impact of that medication yeah. That's sort of the same thing if you try to smoke it. And that's the, the method of delivery argument. Where and I, and I think really that this issue, the reason why it's such a hot button issue is because uh, to me it, it's it's an emotional issue, but at the same time it's rational. Like I personally believe that people who are sick, uh, if they don't want to take pills, they should be able to take uh, medicinal marijuana legally and in the right way to, to ease their pain. But I think it's emotional at the same time because you have people who are sick and who really wants to deny a sick person, you know, what they need to feel better. But then rationally, you can't argue that sick people need good medicine, so to speak. But, you know, how do we put this in place? I mean, we haven't even, like, no commission, no bylaws, no, I mean, if, let's say it passes, people vote yes at uh, the general election. How many years do you think it's going to be before we see the first marijuana prescribed? I, you know, that, that, those are unknown questions again. Uh, it's a very it's an unknown question. One, one of the big deals are uh, is the strengths. The, the, right now, they don't even have standard strengths for for um, for certain treatments. So and then you have doctors having to deal with that. Okay, if it's yeah. a smoke version, the the variety the variety of plants out there is you know the, the strengths. My understanding can vary even within a plant. So so how do you regulate that? So it's, it's just it's going to be something that. It's something that really needs thought and a few sentences in a, in a, in a, in a, on a ballot. You know, on a ballot isn't necessarily going to cover all of that. You know. uh, I'm curious uh, while we're on the subject of marijuana, how much of uh, or how many of the cases that the prosecute at the AG's office involve the marijuana? But you know, we have uh, marijuana cases, but most of the marijuana cases we have our possession cases. And if uh, you if uh, you recall some of our our statutes. It's less than an ounce, it's not even a crime, it's basically a violation. And if you're a first time offender and you are possessing, uh, you will not go to jail. So you know, one of the issues that, that is also brought up is that, that the, the, the prisons are chock full of uh, uh, offenders, marijuana, people who possess marijuana. Yeah. That's not true, that's not necessarily true. Uh, it's I mostly ice users, right? They're ice. It's ice, in which everyone I think agrees is, is a pretty serious, uh, dangerous drug. Yeah. I mean, having you can get addicted to that after your first hit. Wow. And again, that also suffers the you know, purity and purity that vacillates as far as strength is concerned too. But, uh, but you know, I'm not I'm not immune to the to the argument that that uh, that really sick individuals should persons with terminal uh, illnesses. I have uh, two in-laws that passed away because of uh, cancer, and to see them suffering is something that breaks anyone's heart. So I have, you, you, I have you, relatives that have died. Right. So you're saying that while you do have a stance and you have a lot of questions about it, your mind is not entirely made up. Right. I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a robot. Yeah. I, I'm a. Uh, I. Even though I'm the attorney general, even though I, I prosecute crimes, I try to follow the law. I still have that. You know, I still have that. That, uh, human side where I, I need to think about that too. That, that's, that's what I meant about the emotional side. Right, right. It's it's difficult. It's difficult to sometimes compartmentalize things. Uh, but in certain cases, uh, you need to do that. You know, homicide cases, you can't. I mean, you, you sympathize with the family's victims and so forth, but you don't want to get too emotionally wrapped up in it because there's another one coming down the road. Yeah. And, um, you want to give the victims' families the best. Service you can, but understand that you have. Uh, hey, nice sign. Yeah. Uh, uh, you you have um, to take care of, of them and their needs, and, and uh, but you, you don't. You have to understand there's going to be another.
wrong side down the road, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and uh, with this most recent case of the, the Gargarita, uh, not guilty murder, guilty on, on manslaughter. And the right. family of, of the victim just up in arms, crying, sobbing, uh, screaming outside the, the courtroom. As an attorney general and uh, with, with your prosecutors in tow and the good people at your office, do you look at, at this Gargarita case, do you look at that as, as a victory in terms of, yeah, we got a conviction, it wasn't murder, but it was manslaughter, and Gargarita's going to do at least you know 15 years. Is that something that you look at as a victory, even though the family of the victim is, is uh, so offended? Uh, Right. Down I, to the very core. I, I don't, you know, I don't look at a victory, look at this as a victory for anyone because, of course, the family lost the, the loved one. Um, but when we look at the, when we take the case, take any case from the very beginning, we look at everything and, and see what can, what is the evidence that will support this charge, the most serious charge. And we believe that there was enough evidence to support the highest charge that we did charge. Um, and we present that evidence as well as we can and make sure and we try to, under, to get the jurors to understand where we're coming from, we make the arguments uh, and so forth and, and, and as good or as, as bad a case may be in any, any case, sometimes cases with real good evidence doesn't go the way we want it um, and sometimes cases with, with just a small amount uh, we're able to get conviction. So it's you never know what the jurors are thinking. You always try to make sure that, that you present the best case possible. Um, but at the end, it's up to them. You have 12 people sitting there in the room looking at everything. And um, with some cases, what, with uh, the Soto case, you had them sitting for, for two weeks. Yeah. And um, I wasn't necessarily concerned that it was going on that long because there was a lot of there was a lot of evidence. A lot of documents, yeah. a, lot a lot of, of documents, reports, pictures, pictures and videos yeah. that. Uh, and so, and, and they were rehearing some of the testimony. So I wasn't too concerned about that. But when you get back to Gargarita, the families, um, generally, generally families, they they, uh, they they do want and they hope for the for, for the best in cases. Uh, and when it doesn't work out that way, you know, I I just uh, uh, I, I'm concerned that sometimes maybe families set themselves up for for a disappointment. It's a disappointment, obviously, but. But for us, the alternative would have been that he didn't. That, that, that he walked. That he walked. And yeah. The jury's found. The jury found him not guilty because we firmly believe that there was a crime committed. Yeah. And um, so we try. We try our best to, to put that evidence forward. And sometimes, even in our best cases, uh, unfortunately, because of uh, various reasons, uh, evidence may not come in. Yeah. The judge may rule some evidence. Uh, not admissible or inadmissible, and, uh, and so we just have to move forward with what we have. Was the case of the, the Bank of Guam robbery in Jigo, was that an example of, of what you just said? Because uh, it, it kind of seemed like, at least from you know Joe Cruz, the average Joe Cruz out there, his eyes, that it was maybe open shut. Was it was it less open shut uh, from where you're standing? It, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't open and shut. It was, uh, it was one of these cases where and, and a lot of cases work this way, especially when you have co-defendants. Again, you have co-defendants, you have uh, people with varying responsibilities in the case, and you, know, you need experienced prosecutors to, to, to look at that. When there are varying responsibilities and you decide that, um, and you're able to offer uh, a plea agreement with the least culpable or less culpable person, someone who seems less culpable, uh, you will hope that the, the follow through. And we have to always make the argument in those cases when you have three or four or five co-defendants that, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we are, there are witnesses in this case that, that aren't Mother Teresa, that aren't the Pope. And so you, know, you need to understand that you obviously need to, uh, um, to go through the whole testimony and believe whether or not they, they will testify. And we can think that scholastically and scholarly think of all that but ultimately when that person is sitting on the stand they've got other things going on in their mind they have the power I mean he, he basically made a deal and then when it came to, to the courtroom he said oh no you know what I'm not talking yeah I'm and no snitch I'm no snitch I'm I'm, uh, I'm gonna take all the responsibility to me that's saying that yeah those other guys are responsible also but 
so we have to just go with that and we can't go forward uh, when one of our chief witnesses who from the very beginning was going to agree uh, backs out and he was an individual that his stories kept on going back and forth yeah. too so yeah. but we have to go with what we can and, uh, and hopefully hopefully uh, uh, victims like Bank of Guam or these other would have, would have learned like these institutions would have learned set up a, a better uh, security systems uh, place uh, place ATMs in a better spot have a better alarm systems all sorts of things and, and hopefully those things get put in place uh, with, with the pleading since we're on this uh, the subject of pleading does it does it seem to you and maybe it does to some people in, in the public that a lot of cases get uh, plead out and well, maybe not a lot because you know I'm not a lawyer, but when I look at some of the cases, it, it kind of seems like maybe that uh, you guys are trying to get these guys to accept a plea to ensure the conviction. Is that kind of how it works? Maybe if you could walk us through. Okay, I can get this guy to plea to this slightly lesser charge. He's going to go away. I save taxpayer money by not going to trial. Is that kind of the mentality? That's that, uh, plea bargaining. We that well, saving taxpayer money is not a primary primary thought. Primary thought is is making sure that this person is is, uh, is uh, held accountable and responsible for what he or she did. Um, in a situation where there are multiple defendants, then we again make that analysis of uh, of, uh, of uh, degrees of culpability. And then in a situation where they're by themselves, we look at the whole case, the amount of evidence, um, what kind of evidence we have. Not only the amount, but the quality of the evidence. So we can have. Uh, an eyewitness, just one eyewitness, but if we believe or believe that this witness is, is such high quality, um, we can go forward, but we can have a lot of witnesses and, and not a lot of witnesses observing something, but, but have no real clear exact you know, uh, view of what happened. You know, in a, a bar situation, a bar room situation, yeah. bar fight, uh, something generally starts and you're standing there and you hear something happened and then you look and you know when you watch uh, football games who gets penalized the second guy who throws the punch right uh, it's not the first guy um, it's the guy who retaliates so it's 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 a difficult thing for, for prosecutors to sit down and analyze um, the varying culpabilities in a case and try to get all the evidence and of course we are partnered with GPD we need to work with them and get the the, uh, the uh, testimonies or get the, the evidence that, that they've been gathering and uh, work with them to, to secure these convictions. Uh, this election, I think it, uh, I, I think you're, you're kind of at a, a crossroads here seeking a second term. Uh, coming from the U.S. Attorney's Office, I mean, as the U.S. Attorney, that must have been something to go from uh, being with Uncle Sam where, you know, the funding is, is not a problem to being the elected Attorney General of Guam where, you know, Lord knows uh, funding, personnel issues, th those are always where they're, they're up the heads. Oh, well, Guam, being uh, the U.S. Attorney for Guam then, and CNMI isn't necessarily, uh, just because you're U.S. Attorney doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's, you have it's a deep pocket. And we are, it's relative. You know, we were the furthest out, so, it's, so we, we have to, to scream the loudest and uh, Make the noise to, to get whatever funding we needed. Yeah, and that, we we were subject to uh, some of the hiring restrictions back in the, the early uh, early part of the or about 20, 2004, or five, the four or five six days. when when there were uh, right when there were the, the furloughs and so forth. We were we were stuck with that travel. You know, travel went down, yeah. uh, and then so it was just down to essential essential travel. And, and now uh, I say you're at a crossroads because uh, your opponent uh, uh, in this election, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were a prosecutor under her when she was an appointed attorney general. Yes, I was. I was. And so uh, she's no slouch, Elizabeth Barron Anderson, a judge, a former attorney general appointed, right. uh, you being elected uh, by the people. What do you think uh, Liz has to do to beat you this election? Uh, me to, to I don't want her to give you, you, yeah, I don't want you to give uh, her a battle plan but you know what, what kind of campaign are you expecting from her because I know you guys are friends well yeah we are friends we've been go back a long time in fact there was one time when uh, I was back in chambers with her when she was a judge and she was telling me what a great job I was doing as, uh, as uh, 
It's a US attorney. And, and Too bad you couldn't make that into a commercial. Well, you know, I, I didn't think ahead to have my, uh, my, my uh, GoPro on. GoPro, yeah. I didn't have GoPros back then. Uh, no, well, I what I want to do is I want to talk about what my office, what I have done with the office since I started and, and where I've gone from. I, 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 I don't really want to necessarily talk about my point because that, that, that uh, uh, it's always a difficult thing to, yeah. to do with anyone going against someone. You, you always want to talk about about what you want to do and what you've done and what you want to uh, uh, do going forward from from January, maybe January when uh, you start again, start up again. So I agree. She is. Uh, she's. She has a. a, a Impressive uh, uh, background, impressive resume, but I believe I also have the same uh, sort of. I'm, frankly, I'm you know really I'm not I haven't been in the same positions, but I think I have a fairly impressive uh, resume myself. Being a um, prosecutor from the very beginning, it's all I've done. Worked in uh, the office, securing convictions. I've had my my losses, but yeah. I've had my, my wins. Back let's so, talk. Let's and, uh, switch gears here because uh, I understand as attorney general. It's a little, uh, it's a different animal than, you know, running for governor or senator. Uh, you see a lot of the gubernatorial, the senatorial candidates, they call each other out and they, you know what I mean? They, they kind of make it into, into a war, but with attorney general, you kind of don't really want to get too much into the politicking. Well, you know, here, here's a, one big difference with uh, Guam is that in the United States with all the different other states' attorneys, the majority of the, the attorney, attorneys general out there are partisan. They are either Republican or Democrats. Yeah. So there will necessarily be fights, and yeah. most of it, and a lot of it, will be uh, about the ideology and how, you know, well, obviously it's going to be how they're going to run their office, but also different stances on, on different things. Democrats being right. bad, Republicans being right. Right. So, and even even if you're a, and I've found many times, even as a, if you're a Republican attorney general, Republican uh, legislature and a Republican governor, they will find find things to uh, scrawl about, and fight about. So it's after the election, you know, we're all everyone's supposed to come together. But many times, there's still a lot of there's there's still a lot of things that, that need to be ironed out, and that's what what uh, happens out there with with us. There's probably two or three nonpartisan uh, AGs. One of them soon to be the uh, the CNMI because they are going to become. Um, the newest elected position, uh, District of Columbia, is uh, has been has been uh, working on their statutes to uh, to have an, an elected AG. But well, do you, do you think that we need to go to the partisan route? Do you think that we should see a Democrat no. a candidate no. and a Republican? I, I don't think so. General? I don't think so. Our our, our uh, I think our jurisdiction Guam is is way too small for that because um, I think we do need. I mean, and and then the the. The, the reason why the the office was cre was created in the first place was to eliminate the the partisanship that yeah. goes along. Lord knows that was a problem back in the days of the appointed attorney general. It, it was, it was, and unfortunately, you know, being appointed attorney general, um, you're beholding to one person, and that's the governor. As an elected attorney general, in a nonpartisan, a nonpartisan elected attorney general, you're beholding to the whole population. Uh, I mean, a, a Republican AG, he may be uh, uh, trying to get votes for Republican uh, voters, which, you know, I, I see a lot of value to the nonpartisan. It's working. It's been working. Um, some people argue that, hey, you know, the, the governor and the AG shouldn't be fighting. And I don't, I don't see this fighting. I see it as a as, as, uh, lively, valuable debate, and we will have disagreements that need to be aired, um, and that's what needs to happen. In an appointed position, I mean, what's, what's the appointed AG thinking except, oh, I better not disagree. I better not uh, piss off the boss. So right, speak. and that's the, the governor's the boss. Uh, yeah, and I agree we've come a long way from the days of the appointed AG where but the appointed attorney general, a lot of times, was just like there to rubber stamp things. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Um, but one thing I can say is, in my this office, um, and I can say the same thing for 
Same same thing for the other electric other elect AGs. There wasn't a rubber stamp. And that's we don't want a rubber stamp attorney yeah. general. Yeah. Checks and balances. Checks and balances needs needs to be, you know, unless that for that to work, we really need a nonpartisan uh, AG. And I every time I go out and I talk to people, that's what they want. They do not want it to go back. Uh, and said the legislature had floated that out a while back, and uh, I think pretty soundly, uh, was, they just said no. Uh, we've only got a, a couple minutes here, so uh, earlier you were talking about having had your losses and, and your wins. What do you think was uh, your biggest loss here in your, your first term as uh, elected attorney general? No oh, biggest loss? Um, in what terms of what? Just in, in general, whether it be a case or uh, maybe just a battle that you guys fought as an office. Yeah, that, that's, I don't know, that's difficult. Uh, I think uh, when you think about a loss, I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's difficult for me to say because every time there's a loss, uh, people assume that that the other side, the, the side that lost, didn't do their best. And my feeling is, loss or wins, especially losses. I think in my case, my office's case, I think if we lost anything, it's not it's not without trying. We have you know, tried legally and to do the best we could for the people. And that, that's, I mean, it's hard for me to. to to say a winner or loss because I think that every time we've tried and wasn't um, successful in either the courts or the legislature or with the administration, I think that we, we had tried to do our best in whatever that issue was. Would it be easier to say what your biggest uh, victory was in the last four years? Well, I, th I think what uh, we've done, and again, I think was because of the, the hard work of the office, is that we've been able to, from the very beginning, we kind of reestablished that separation of powers concept. From the very first uh, part of my term, we had several uh, opinions that established that separation of powers, keeping the legislature separate from the, from the judiciary, from the executive. I think that's, that's one big thing that I think that we've been able to uh, accomplish. I think we've been able to accomplish uh, things in the, in the, from the civil side, we've been able to, to, to bring, try to get more, uh, better laws done as far as uh, um, procurement is concerned. Child support, child support um, has, and we've talked about this yeah. in your show, we've increased collections, we've increased disbursements, we're making sure that the children receive the money. We have our issues. Uh, there's some issues that we are working out, but we listen to the, the problems and we're trying to we try to fix them. But overall, I think with child support, um, it's gotten a whole lot better than it was in, in the past. And that staff that I have back there, real dedicated. And we're closing out August as a child support enforcer. Right, yeah. And um, we've, uh, we, when we did our outreaches, we talked about we brought more people in. And uh, again, disbursements. We're, we're giving out a million dollars, over a million dollars a month wow. child support. And I don't know how many uh, agencies on this island can say they, they've done that. So you, you put some teeth in the, to the child support. Uh, right, right. And it helps that uh, we, we have the, the 4 day program of the federal, uh, the federal government because we're able to, to, uh, to network with our sister agencies or other agencies out there uh, because that way we're able to enforce um, each other's, each other's uh, orders out there. Criminally, um, I can't say enough about my prosecution team. They've been just hitting it every single day. We've had trials. When we're doing the soda, people don't know that at the time, this one trial that kind of captured everyone's attention, we still had four trials a week going on. And we were getting convictions while this trial was going on too. We had attorneys that were stepping up. They would be doing their closing arguments in the morning and then, then start off a jury selection in the afternoon that same day so the co the camaraderie and the esprit de corps in that division is, is real good uh last uh what is it uh, so last year sometime our prosecution team put together uh, a perimeter team so we ran uh the perimeter relay i was i was one of the legs uh, two of the legs but uh, we had guys out there who couldn't you know run a mile or two of me joining this team and suffered for a good five, six hours on the road, 
and uh, enjoyed every minute of it. So. And, and, and now we're, we're starting to see a little uh, more of uh, Leonardo Rapatis, the person. I mean, no. you know, prosecutor, uh, U.S. attorney, uh, attorney general of Guam. Uh, you've held so many public positions, and, and I feel, and maybe the average person out there feels that we don't really know you. Tell us a little bit about yourself as, as a person. Uh, well, I'm uh, actually, I'm a product of my, uh, my uh, mother and father. They both uh, came from public service. My father was uh, uh, from the Philippines. He, his parents came from Zamboanga. He came out uh, kind of at the behest of his brothers to do some construction. So he came out. Um, started working in construction. My mother is uh, from here, born and raised, Cirilla Rapatis. My father, Danilo K. Rapatis. And uh, my father started working at the Matias store. Carmen Matias is my grandmother. He started working there and uh, my mother and my father met and um, fell in love and, and here I am. So my mother was, she's still alive. My father's passed away. Uh, my mother is, uh, um, worked in the Guam Memorial Hospital, she's worked at Guam Health Planning, she's, and many people come up to me to this day and say, hey, I used to work with your mom, and I would think automatically, Catholic Social Service, because that's where she spent yeah, a lot of her time. Yeah, I know she was at CSS. Does it, right. does it, does it, does it humble you at all and remind you of your roots when, uh, as a grown man who's the elected Attorney General, you still run into people who know you? because of your mom. Oh yeah, yeah. And or they always, the ne invariably the next thing that comes, I remember when you were this tall, you know, <laughs> they'd have their hands down by their knee or I, I used to change your diapers. That kind of takes me back, but uh, yeah, so. Um, and then other times they'll say, yeah, I used to work with your mom at uh, Gormara Hospital. And that was just yesterday, someone came up to me. My father, he, uh, I believe he was one of the first Filipinos to, to become a police officer in uh, the then DPS, Department of Public Safety, and uh, was a, a well known to be a crack shot. He worked, worked in the armory, um, was working up at the airport as security for a while. And, you know, he was actually, uh, at a time, uh, security up at the, uh, at the uh, Department of Corrections. And he would, he, I kind of get some of my attitude from him. He, he, he doesn't like conflict, so he actually, um, when you talk about uh, respect and talking to people, he, he got to know some of the inmates, and they knew him, and he treated the inmates. You know, you know, a lot of the people in the in the DOC, they've done bad things, and they're doing their time right now, and they need to be treated with respect. And I, my dad did that. You know, he knew that they did something wrong. He treated them with respect, and they treated him with respect. And they so that's where you kind of get your. Uh uh, not necessarily peacemaker, but you're you always seem like you're willing to talk things over and work it out before it reaches that stage. I am. Hey, we're suing each other. Right. I mean, I, I am. When we get to that point where we are suing each other, um, something broke down. Something broke down. So we, we tried. Uh, uh, last question here. I, I, I just want to know why why do you do it? Why 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 do you run for attorney general? What what powers you to? to this life of public service, and it's not the easiest life. I'm pretty sure it, it's probably easier to be a senator or a mayor. Why? Why attorney general? Well, again, it goes back to my my family roots. My my parents is that that uh, dedication to public service. Uh, my father was again police officer, customs officer. I, I didn't necessarily want to walk around carrying a gun and and, and uh, forcing the law that way. Uh, I'm not built that way, but I want to contribute law enforcement in a different way, That's, which is one of the reasons why I went into uh, uh, the prosecutor's office for the first time. Um, and as, as the U.S. Attorney, I wanted to serve Guam in a different way. You know, the, the, I was serving a larger, a larger picture uh, when I did that, but serving as Attorney General, man, I just, it's, it's such a different, uh, it's a different feeling. Instead of Instead of uh, having to reach out to Washington all the time, I get to reach out to people here. Good here, point. You know, yeah. So um, I don't know how many times I've seen you uh, uh, over the last four, you know, four years. I've seen you a lot more in four years than my seven years as a yeah. U.S. attorney. Yeah. And uh, so I get to to I get to go to Kings and, and talk to people about about um, hey, you know, how's it going in the office? And then I order my uh, my uh, and and you know, all of that stuff. And, 
I get to go to the flea markets, those things like that, and just be out there. So uh, you would say, I guess, from what I'm getting is that you did the stuff with the federal side, U.S. attorney, prosecutor, but at the end of the day, you're at that age where you want to be here and, and make here safer for the people. I, I, that's that's what I did. That's what I wanted to do when I first started as a AG. I wanted to do that when I was a U.S. attorney, and I still uh, want to do that as attorney general. And of course, as attorney general, I've got a larger scope. It's not just criminal. I'm looking at the whole... Uh, uh, Enchilada, you know, the bigger picture. The and, whole uh, chalaquilas. The whole chalaquilas, yes, the whole pot of chalaquilas with the, with the chicken and uh, everything in there. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I, I, I'd rather, um, I'd much rather be in this position than, than in my old position. So, win or lose, uh, after the general, uh, what's the first thing you're going to do? After the general? Yeah. Uh, tempted to say you know take a few days off and relax but you know what it's it's a it's a it's something that that uh, that uh, uh, I'd like to do but this position is a position that you need to be engaged at all times and um, and then I do I might I, I can't see myself doing anything but just getting back in and just starting up again and, just uh, another day the day just, after the election it, it's exactly what it's gonna be it's gonna be another day um, I mean win or lose I'll be there. Attorney General, good luck. Chris, it's been nice uh, cruising with you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll see you. Brought to you by Triple J, celebrating 30 years of putting our customers first.